Good afternoon. Before we begin, I have some sad news. Herman Stein, a pioneer and the professor of social work and a longtime leader in our community, passed away this morning. Professor Stein served as our provost and as dean of the School of Applied Social Sciences. He received the Hovorka Prize in 2002 and the University Medal in 1994. Working on the global stage, he played a pivotal role in advancing the well-being of children through UNICEF and the United Nations. At this time, I ask that we observe a moment of silence in his honor. Thank you. Now I want to tell all of you how much I appreciate your coming to this year's State of the University Address, especially given today's terrible weather. <laughs> so you, you get extra points for coming through the rain to get here. This marks our very first of these addresses with faculty and staff together. And I want to thank the Faculty Senate for approving the rule change that allowed this joint session and the Staff Advisory Council for agreeing to this arrangement as well. To me, this way is so much better. First, of course, it means I only have to give one speech. But second, and actually more important, I like the symbolism of the change. We are one institution. Our success depends on collaboration among schools and departments, between faculty and staff. You all should hear the same message at the same time. You all should hear the same questions and the same answers. The reason is simple. You all are part of the same single community, the community that is Case Western Reserve University. When I gave this address a year ago, we had much to be proud of. We had completed the strategic plan, set a new record for the third highest fundraising total in history, improve the academic credentials of the entering class, and receive some nice coverage of research breakthroughs, like Richard Hansen's Mighty Mouse and the new material that emulated the sea cucumber. But then came the global economic crisis. All of our budding enthusiasm ran smack into pervasive economic uncertainty. Places like Harvard and Yale laid off workers. Other universities enacted hiring freezes and furloughs. At Case Western Reserve, fortunately, we never relied as much on endowment returns to support the operating budget. As a result, we've been able to avoid such dramatic cuts. That said, the raise pool was much smaller than I would have liked, even after we eliminated the raises for senior leaders like me, the provost, the vice presidents, and the deans. Most worrisome, we didn't know what the financial collapse might mean for our fundraising. Some foundations stopped accepting proposals altogether, and others promised steep reductions in grants. We had worked so hard to establish our momentum, and last fall it appeared likely, even very likely, that the external forces might stop us in our tracks. Instead, as I think many of you know, this summer we learned that such grim forecasts had been mistaken. Our fundraising didn't just stay even, it grew by more than $5 million to $108.7 million, which is a new record for the second highest gift total in the university's history. We also set a new record for the annual fund, $7.6 million. How did we do it? Well, first and foremost, people kept believing in us. Former board chair Franklin Salata and his wife Jocelyn made a $3 million gift in October of last year, a time when the financial outlook was at its most murky. In February, trustee Chuck Fowler and his wife Shar invested $7.5 million in the work of Professor David Cooper Ryder and in the idea of sustainable value. And in June, board chair Bud Koch and his wife Katie announced $5 million toward a student-centered project on our campus. These generous gifts sent a powerful signal to others. Our trustees, the people who know us best, wanted to donate now. In this climate, it would be easier and certainly understandable to wait. But our trustees consider the work of the university 
your work to be too important to delay. It wasn't only donors who believed. In the spring, Congress approved a stimulus package that included millions and millions of dollars for new research. You didn't simply respond to this opportunity, you seized it with both hands. Our faculty submitted nearly 700 proposals for stimulus dollars. Staff in the schools and in our Central Research Administration office toiled dozens and dozens of extra hours to process all of those applications. To date, we have received 94 awards totaling more than $40 million. So congratulations to all of you on delivering on that result. It wasn't only the donors and our faculty and staff who believed. High school seniors believed too. In 2008-2009, our university set a new record for total applications. We tripled the number of international students who enrolled and dramatically increased the percentage of students who came from outside Ohio. In addition, we raised the average SAT score of the entering class by 19 points in one year. Those gains don't happen by accident. They emerge from strategy and an awful lot of hard work in admissions, financial aid, and by people all across the university. Now, as you know, global economic uncertainty is far from over. It is way too soon to say how our fundraising will fare in 2009-2010. But for now, I can tell you this. I have no doubt of how hard Bruce Locine and his team will work on development, just as I have every confidence in the team for enrollment management and in all of our other university organizations. And I am just as confident in the talent and dedication of the faculty and staff in every school and every unit across the university. You, all of you, have proved your talent and your commitment. Whatever obstacles we may encounter in the short term, I think the future of this university is bright. Certainly the data give reason for optimism, but so do individuals. Over the past year, we've added several remarkable individuals to our team. First among them, of course, is Bud Bazelak, our provost. Bud, Bud is unable to be here today because his daughter is getting married in Columbus. I cannot let today pass without telling you how much I have appreciated his tireless work, his collaborative nature, and his dedication to advancing our strategic plan. As many of you know, his office will be awarding a number of competitive grants to interdisciplinary alliance groups this semester as part of his efforts. Bud is a great partner, and I am so glad he's part of Case Western Reserve. In addition, last spring, he appointed David Fleschler as our first ever Associate Provost for International Affairs. David has done a wonderful job learning about the programs we have already and looking at ways we can enhance coordination and develop new programs as well. Another priority of the strategic plan is diversity. In fact, we identified it as a core value. Because this issue is so very important, we created a cabinet level position, a vice president of inclusion, diversity, and equal opportunity at the university. After an intense search, Ably led by Professor Rhonda Williams, we appointed Marilyn Sanders Mobley to this crucial role. Marilyn earned her doctorate here at Case Western Reserve and so has called her return a homecoming. Over the past several months, Marilyn's become reacquainted with the university. She is identifying opportunities to improve and expand our diversity efforts involving faculty, staff, and students. Finally, we named John Sedaris as our permanent chief financial officer. John brings tremendous professionalism, accountability, and strategic thinking to our operations. He and his team, including Treasurer Bob Brown and Chief Investment Officer, officer Sally Staley, have been at the forefront of managing our financial challenges this year, and they have truly excelled. I am grateful to all of them. Also in the finance area, I'm pleased to note that as of yesterday, we have a new Vice President for Financial Planning. Donald Stewart comes to us from Brown University, and we're delighted to have him with us. 
Now, as some of you know, over the past academic year, our marketing and communications team has been working on what they call brand positioning. That is meeting with faculty, staff, and students and looking at ways that our university is distinctive. They've sought answers to these questions. What is special about Case Western Reserve? What is most appealing about our university? How do we best tell our story? Eventually, after lots of brainstorming and feedback, the group came upon a new tagline for the university, think beyond the possible. So I ask you, what does this mean? Think about our university and all that takes place here every single day. Our people cure cancer. They create cars that can drive themselves. They train participants in international criminal tribunals like the one of Saddam Hussein. Every one of them and many, many more think beyond the possible in everything they do and all that they aspire to be. Once we had the tagline, Glenn Beeler and his team set to work on a video to give life to those words. I'm going to show the final result to you in a moment, but first I want to talk about some of the people you're going to see on the screen. Chris Butler came to Case Western Reserve as an undergraduate 30 years ago. He stayed on for a master's degree and during his graduate studies discovered a love for teaching. He is known for the catchphrase, math is easy, math is fun and something called the inverted vector dance. You'll have to ask him about that. Chris has won multiple university awards for teaching and mentoring, and also helped lead efforts to honor his late friend and colleague, Professor Ignacio Ocasio, also known as Doc Ock. Cynthia Bell is professor of anthropology who is fascinated by the way people adjust to their environments, in particular, the high altitudes of places like the Andes and Tibet. She is co-director of the University Center for Research on Tibet and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Renee Santillis is professor of history. Her most recent book centered on a Civil War entertainer who was one of the first women to realize that even scandalous publicity has its benefits. In fact, Santillis calls her a 19th century version of Madonna. Chris Menachi founded and directs the flight nursing program at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. In 2007, he received a national award recognizing his leadership in research and education for the air medical field. And in 2008, he led Case Western Reserve's efforts to launch a program with a university in Japan to create the first flight nursing program in Asia. Gilbert Doho is a professor of modern languages and literature and the founding director of our ethnic studies program. He believes passionately in the power of theater to promote positive social change and is the author of several plays, among them The Lily Lake and Wedlock of Ashes. Mark Singer is a professor in the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences whose work focuses largely on the impact of violence on children. More recently, he's worked with the city of Cleveland on an ambitious effort to help its police officers deal with the stress of their dangerous jobs. Adit Zahavi is a professor of astronomy and physics. She is participating in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the largest ever mapping effort of the galaxy. This has provided insight into the ways of dark matter and led to new discoveries about the nature of the Milky Way. These are just a few of the people highlighted in this roughly three minute video. Pause and think about them for a minute. Think about the diversity of academic fields reflected among just this handful of individuals. More, think about their passion, their curiosity, their enthusiasm for teaching for learning and exploring. And finally, think about the notion that they represent a tiny fraction of our community. We have so many more amazing, accomplished, dedicated people here. It's awe-inspiring, isn't it? This is what we mean when we say at Case Western Reserve, we think beyond the possible. Teaching and learning are intellectual exercises to be sure 
but their impact increases exponentially when emotion is brought to the equation. Emotion is what makes a person like Chris Minacci climb into a tiny flying egg called a helicopter to rescue someone he doesn't even know. It's what drives Chris Butler to hold hours-long math galas to help students prepare for finals. It's what sends Cynthia Bell to frigid mountaintops again and again to interview indigenous people there. That combination of head and heart is what we tried to do with this video. You'll let us know how we fared, but first let me emphasize again, this is an in-house production. No models, no expensive advertising agencies. This is Case Western Reserve. So let me ask the people who were the stars of our show to please stand up and turn around so everyone can see you and thank you. Thank you all for taking a leap of faith with us. I'm not sure what you were thinking when you got that call. We're going to make a video, totally homegrown, and we'd like you to be in it. You all said yes, and we're really grateful for that. Of course, I can't not mention the person whose vision 
is reflected in every single frame of this video. And I want you to know how much discussion, argument, debate, went into every image and every word that is on the screen in order to capture the, the breadth of Case Western Reserve. Well, that person is Mary Garrity. Mary, where are you? a remarkable effort. Thank you, Mary. Thanks also to Laura Kalafaitis, I see her back there, and Glenn Beeler, and the team in University Marketing and Communications, Mike Cubitt, Steve Kupchik, and Peter Berman from MediaVision. They all worked hard to make this happen. And I also have to thank the students who built that bridge out of Legos. <laughs> and Mary's knowing Gosh, that's an opportunity. Maybe we should get out there and shoot that. They built it just because they could right before commencement, and it makes a great image for the video. So thanks to everybody who contributed to this terrific video. I'm proud to be showing it. I showed it this summer to our incoming students and their parents in orientation, and we're showing it at alumni events all this year. So let me ask everybody who worked on the video, Mary, you gotta stand up one more time, to please stand up and receive our thanks. Laura, Glenn, everybody please. Now that the credits are complete, let me just say again how honored I am to be with all of you on this campus. It is a remarkable place, made even more so because of all of you. I'm grateful for all you've done and will continue to help to do to help us make this institution everything we know it can be. Thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your aspirations. Thank you for being part of our university community. Now, I would be happy to come down these stairs and answer questions or talk about anything you'd like to talk about. Questions, comments, thank you. Oh, surely somebody has something, come on. Something you don't like, <laughs> okay, or something you do. Uh, a while back, you, oh, you want me to uh, they, Yeah, we want everybody to hear you. A while back you had identified um, in response to, I guess, both faculty and staff, uh, things that you were aiming to improve at the university. One of these uh, included an on-site daycare center, and the other was trying to get at least faculty salaries, I'm not, I, I don't know staff salaries, but maybe staff salaries as well, to a level that seemed to be appropriate relative to our peer institutions. And given that these were the first two priorities that came up, I was wondering what the current status was. So we did work on childcare and got a wonderful report from a group of faculty and staff, and it even included a graduate student, on some things that we could do for childcare in the short term, as well as trying to lay the groundwork for the long term. So the two priorities that they identified after a survey uh, that, that we did campus-wide the two priorities they identified as being most important for faculty and staff on this campus were emergency child care, when a child gets sick and you have to get to work, and, and um, travel so that you, when you need to go somewhere to a conference or something, help with defraying child care expenses. So we have a, a new program uh, that we're piloting to see how it goes, and we are doing two things to address those. On the emergency child care, we have a referral service now. We've contracted with them. And I think you get a few free referrals at the beginning, but they're, it, it's, a, you know, it's a good, at least we are told and we have investigated this, a very good provider of emergency child care when you need to go to work and you have a child who's sick and can't go to school or to the regular daycare situation. So that's the first thing. And the second thing with regard to travel, we have set aside a fund of money and faculty and staff and I think students, although it would mostly be graduate students attending conferences with children can apply to get expenses defrayed for childcare. And they can use that either to take the child with them wherever they're going and get, the, get help on that end 
or to pay for childcare expenses if they leave the child at home or children at home. So we're doing those on a short-term basis. Beyond that, we have been working with some of our partners, including the Music School Settlement and University Circle, who were both interested in working with us. And our committee met with people from both places. And the Music School Settlement has some interest uh, in expanding its program. And we have said that we need uh, infant care as part of the package, which currently is not provided at the Music School Settlement. It's, it's preschool age and up. So we are still talking with them and with University Circle, which is also interested in the possibility of having a more collaborative approach to some kind of on-site child care. We ha have identified a site, but we haven't identified the money to be able to build an on-site facility. It is expensive, and they do not operate without university subsidy. So that's where we are on those. On salaries, we ask the deans on faculty salaries to look at their individual situations in their schools. And each one made an individual decision about how to use the raise money this year, and they varied a bit from place to place. Um, the focus was on, on retaining people most likely to leave and dealing with equity issues, so they, many of them focused on those things. But they did make some different choices around that. And on staff, we gave out a raise pool and asked our managers to, to give that out in the way that best met what they thought were their employee needs. In, in no case was the pool big enough because we had, we had originally planned for and hoped for a better raise pool this year, but the economy made, that, made it impossible to do as large a pool as we had planned. The only way to make progress on salaries that are behind the benchmark is to give a better than benchmark raises for usually at least several years in a row. And we won't know yet whether we did that, although there were a number of places that froze salaries altogether. So to the extent our peers froze and we let those salaries move up, our average might make a bit of progress this year, not as much as we had hoped, but some. And we'll have to see how those come out. Somebody else had a question back here. Can you? Thank you. that the uh, events of yesterday happened too late to get into the, 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 uh, the video, but as we talk about the state of the university, I think we should all take pause at the remarkable event that happened yesterday when that special issue of science came out with our colleagues Scott Simpson and Bruce Latimer's uh, absolutely stunning, stunning. and mind-blowing work. Made the front of the plane dealer today. So I agree, they deserve a huge round of applause. Question? Can you dash up and so everybody can hear you? Oh, no. I'm a part of the oh, you're. Oh, I didn't even see you, Scott. I got a little advance warning on this because Scott and I had lunch <laughs> and, and the day before yesterday, and so he, he let me know that this was going to be coming out on Thursday, which was very exciting. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't see your face back there, but great to have you with us, Scott. Thank you for coming, and I'm glad you got to hear the applause that was all for you and, and Bruce and your other colleagues. It really is wonderful, and of course, it speaks to the power of our partnerships with our university circle institutions because that was something that, that our faculty members and their colleagues at the Museum of Natural History did together. So it's, a, it's truly a great story. Other questions, comments, things you think I should know? It's so quiet, I can't believe nobody wants to talk about anything. People email me with their complaints. You don't have to email and wait for my response. I'm right here. <laughs> Bring it on. Okay, well listen, thank you all so much for coming out in the rain. It's wonderful to have you all here and look forward to another great year. Um, great weather because the sun always shines on Case Western Reserve University. <laughs> thank you.